The scripture for this morning is Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 11. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of the sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Lord, we pray this morning that you would truly give life. We ask that you would give life to to the preaching of your word this morning. And Lord, that you would give, give life as we each hear what you have for us this morning. Lord, we pray, I pray, Lord, that you would just speak to us, and Lord, use me as your vessel in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I guess we're going to test my memory a little bit, because uh, um, last night I come up and I printed the inserts for the bulletin, and I printed off the Apostles' Creed and did all kinds of things. I forgot to make coffee out there, so I did that this morning. Then I realized, like halfway through the songs, that I didn't print off my sermon, so it's on my computer at home. So I'm going to be working from the same uh, thing that you are, and thankfully I didn't make it too difficult that I couldn't even figure out my own answers. So uh, definitely trusting in the Lord this morning. (laughs) Um, We're looking at the question, are spiritual gifts necessary? Um. And what we see from this passage, especially in, I I also usually print it a little bit bigger in my notes, um, in in verse 8 here, um, it says, those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You know, we have two natures, and you know, in, until we become a Christian, we, we only have one nature, and it's sinful, and it might look good on the outside, but it's sinful on the inside. Once you become a Christian, there's a battle that starts. Uh, I don't know if you've experienced that, but it's normal. I remember the first time that I was like, I felt like I had the devil on this shoulder and Jesus on this shoulder, and man, there was a fight. That's because we have two natures. One is the It's called the flesh, the carnal nature, the sinful nature. It's us without Christ. It follows the ways of the world. It follows natural tendencies that have, and we have a, a bent to go away from God. It says in our natural selves, basically, we can't please God. No matter how hard we try, we can't do it which is why Jesus had to come and die. The Old Testament way was obey the best you can, give the best sacrifices you can, work as hard as you can, and try to do your best. And yet the Old Testament way failed because it basically proved to us that we can't do it, that there's none righteous on our own. The New Testament way, Jesus came, died for our sins, sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and he works in us and through us to do things that we could never do on our own. And so that's where God's spiritual gifts come into it. These are powers and strengths and gifts that we could never cook up on our own, no matter how talented we are. So we can never please God on our own human strength. And you know, sometimes we're almost taught that. I remember 
uh, I, being taught in Sunday school that you just try to do more good than bad, and then you'll be all right with God. Well, you know, being inquisitive and curious, I had a couple questions. It's like, you do something really bad, how many really good things do you have to do to equalize that? And how do you know? How do you know where the balances are and all this kind of stuff? Which essentially, that was kind of like the Old Testament way. The New Testament, it levels us all. We're all sinners when we need Jesus. Doesn't matter how much good or how much bad we've done, we need Jesus. But then when it comes to pleasing him and ministering in the church, we have to look at the model that began at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came to empower us. Which brings us to number two. God's work in the church can only be achieved through the energizing power of the Holy Spirit. God's work here can only be achieved through the energizing power of the Holy Spirit. You know, we can work hard, but I don't know about you, I, I run out of energy sometimes. You ever get tired? You know? It's been a hard week. There's not a lot left. You know, that's, a, that's an okay place to be with Jesus because he gives us power that's not our own. And that's what the New Testament teaches. So number three, the gifts of the Spirit, not natural talent, are God's chosen way to do his work. The gifts of the Spirit, not natural talent, are God's chosen way to do his work. You know, if we try to do heavenly work with earthly power, we're going to be frustrated. God is frustrated in the church when we try to do it on our own without the power and strength and gifts of his spirit. You know, we don't have to look very far. Most of us know somebody somewhere who's been hurt by a church. We know churches where there's competition of, you know, who's doing more than somebody else and where there's a lot of times they're run by guilt trips of, well, we really need somebody to do this and whether you have that giftedness or not, we're going we're gonna to pester you until you do it. How fruitful is that going to be? But that's the way we do human things, right? You need something done, you talk somebody into doing it. And there's frustration. It's like the illustration of putting, you know, a, a square peg in a round hole. It just doesn't work. But you know, if you push it hard enough, maybe it will. And sometimes that's the model that we've used. And I'm not talking specifically about this church. I'm talking about Christian churches today and really through, you know, the last several hundred years. It's always a temptation to do it our way. To do it the way that we saw somebody else do it or to, to rely on the human approaches. Because what are you going to do if you're not being led by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, and gifted by the Spirit? You're going to come up with, you know, marketing ideas and advertising ideas and, you know, psychological ways to talk people into doing things and to make them feel better. And I'm not saying that those avenues by themselves, I'm not saying advertising is wrong. What I'm saying is we can't replace the work of God with it. Because as we serve Jesus and as we keep healthy as a church and as individual Christians, you know, I don't know how and I don't know when, but God's going to bring people to in that he need to hear the message that he has for them. I don't have any doubt in that. I don't know when. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know when he's going to open that, that door and, you know, send people and, and bless us. But if we're healthy and if we follow him and if his, his spirit's leading us, he's in control of the results. And... You know, that's the way he wants us to live. Where if we're just trying to, you know, figure it out on our own, 
we're frustrated and the work of God is frustrated. You know, we don't get appreciated enough and so we get resentful. We, you know, somebody picks somebody else instead of us for something. You know, if we are walking in the strength of the Holy Spirit, we shouldn't be offended by those kind of things. You know, God chose certain people for certain things. And I don't know why, but he did. And he blesses that. <clears throat> and there's such a freedom. Because all of those things make us all better as the body of Christ. And so the gifts of the Spirit, not natural talent, are God's chosen way <clears throat> to do his work. Number four, if Jesus himself needed the Holy Spirit for ministry, then so do we. If Jesus himself needed the Holy Spirit to do ministry, then so do we. Jesus spent 30 years not doing any ministry. But when he was baptized and the Holy Spirit came upon him, he spent three and a half years changing the world. If Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, we do too. We are a desperate people. We are so needy on, with him. You know, in our own flesh, in our own strength, we'll fail. Nothing eternal will happen. <clears throat> and I think that's the thing to remember. You know, we can get accolades from people. And maybe at our funeral, they'll say, oh, they did wonderful things. But you know what? If it's not done by the power of the Holy Spirit, it'll never last. It's wood, hay, and stubble that will be burned up in the fire. If it's just human activity, it has no eternal value. And when we stand before God, we say, I tried my best. But he wants so much more than that. He wants his spirit to work in us. Um, there's a verse in Isaiah chapter 42. And it's actually talking about Jesus coming and opening the eyes of the blind and setting the captives free, releasing the, from the dungeon those who are in darkness. So it's a prophecy about Jesus. But then it says in verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. You know what? God is not going to give his glory to anybody else. And... We can't seek glory for God and glory for ourselves at the same time. It just doesn't work. Um, I had a homiletics pa uh, professor, which is a, a preaching class. Um, an old German guy, you could hardly understand his, his, uh, his English because his accent was so strong. But you know, he loved God with all his heart. And he said, you know... <clears throat> It can, never make, it can never be your goal to make yourself and Jesus both look good in the same message. He says, you got to choose one or the other. If you're trying to make yourself look good, it's going to come out this way. And if you're trying to honor Jesus, it's going to come out another way. And I never forget that. Now, it doesn't mean that God may not bless you in the process, but the goal should never be our own glory. And that's a, that's a good check. If we start to see, wow, look at, look at me, we start to get that feeling, that's a, that should be a check in our spirit that, you know what, we're, we're doing this. This is more self than spirit. So Jesus himself needed empowerment for ministry. <clears throat> now, I have a couple quotes here. Thank the Lord I had, I had the ability to... Uh, <laughs> fit them in here, or, or I, I probably wouldn't remember them to quote them exact. Now, A.W. Tozer 
uh, wrote a lot. You can hear him once in a while. You can hear him speak on some of the old archives on the Moody Bible uh, channel. He died in 1963. So this was said a while ago, but I think it still holds true for today. He says, from what I see and sense in evangelical circles, I would have to say that about 90% of the religious work carried on in the churches is being done by ungifted members. I am speaking of men and women who know how to do many things, but who fail to display the spiritual gifts promised through the Holy Spirit. So that was in sometime before 1963, he thought that 90% of what most churches do is by human effort. Vance Havner, writing a little bit later, said, If God would suddenly remove the Holy Spirit from the church today, most of what it does would go on completely unhindered. (laughs) In other words, nobody would even notice. And I'm not saying these things in any way to beat us up, to put us down. I'm just saying God has so much for us. And back to the title, are spiritual gifts necessary? Are spiritual gifts necessary? How else are we going to do it? (laughs) How else are we going to do it? When God gives us gifts and we'll, we'll be continuing on this and we'll talk about the specific gifts Because I'm guessing that some of you are saying, well, I'm not sure what mine are. Well, hopefully through this process, you know, you'll be able to discover and let them them grow and you'll see those. And there's a really broad amount of gifts that God does, some some that we don't even think about. And many that I see at work um, in, you know, in the lives of, of our people. But are they necessary? Absolutely. Because the only other alternative is on our own strength, on our own talents. And you know what? If we were looking for our own talents, I wouldn't be standing here today. I never, ever, ever considered myself a talented speaker. But you know, I found my spiritual gift when I was about, I would have been 18, maybe 19 years old. I'll tell you the story a little bit. I was, I was a relatively new Christian, and I hadn't got it all figured out yet. So I was living with one foot in the world and one foot in church. And, you know, we had a, it, I was still in the youth group because they didn't have anything for anybody else. It was a small church. And um, so I could come to youth group, and I could know the answers and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, my life outside of that wasn't quite the same as it was in church. And our church had a a revival of sorts. Some people started, God moved in their lives and they were sharing testimonies. And, you know, the Lord just spoke to my heart one time and he says, you got to ask forgiveness from the youth group for your hypocrisy. (laughs) God, really? (laughs) Can't I just ask you? Like, no. So I asked the youth leader if I could have a few minutes. And I don't think I told him what I was going to say. But he gave me a little bit of time, and I just laid it out there and said that, you know, I didn't want to be that way anymore, and that I had, you know, been hypocritical in my life. And four or five other youth group members began to cry and said, you know what? I'm in the same boat. I'm in the same boat. I've had that problem too. You know, I haven't really been all in for Jesus. I wasn't expecting that. I didn't know what to do with that. And thankfully the youth leader was there and he could help, you know, pray with them and things like that. Wasn't too long after that, uh, I got asked to go to other churches and talk to their youth groups. I was a shy kid. You know, I didn't know what to say. 
I remember the first time I did it, we went to, it was in Newark, Ohio, a small, a small church there. The whole night before, I didn't even sleep. I was just so scared of, God, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? And, you know, the same thing happened there. I just shared my testimony, and God touched lives. And then they threw me a little bit of curve. It was a small church. They says, we'd just like you to share in front of the whole church. Well, it's one thing sharing with kids a little bit younger than you. It's another thing sharing with people who are like, you know, older than you. But I really, God didn't really give me much choice. So I, I shared. God worked. And from there, because it was in a, in a denomination, it was uh, Christian Missionary Alliance churches, um, I got to speak in a couple other places. I got to speak at churches that were like 700 people. Talk about scary. But you know, when God calls you to do something and gifts you in that area, it just works. It just works. <laughs> And that's when I begin to wonder if I had a call on my life for ministry. Because I knew that when I would share and later when I would teach, that God would change lives. And that was a, a grace gift that he had given to me. It wasn't a natural talent, I'll tell you. Even to this day, if I have to speak on something that's not related to, to God or the Bible, it's kind of oh, a little nervous. Um, <clears throat> and that's the way God uses us. Sometimes he just throws us into those situations and we find out our spiritual gift. Um, I want to look at a couple signs that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are at work. Number one is prayerful dependence. Prayerful dependence. <clears throat> You know, if you're counting on God to work in and through you, prayer's the only way. I've heard it said that anybody who doesn't pray is either ignorant or arrogant. Either they're ignorant in the fact, and, and I don't mean that as an insult, they just don't know what God wants to do in their lives. Or they're arrogant, they think that they don't need him. <laughs> and when it comes to walking in the spirit, living in the spirit, we have to depend on God. Because you know what? If God doesn't show up here this morning, and if God doesn't show up in the things that we do, we might as well go home because we're wasting our time. And so that's why we pray. That's why we trust. And it's not just in things in church either. It's as we go through our day. You know, I'm, I'm going to guess that most of us have challenges each day that are too big for us. And so we ask God for his help. Prayerful dependence. Because if it all relies on me, uh, you know what? <laughs> it's not going to go very far. So that's one of the signs. The second sign is faith. Faith. Now, there's the, the spiritual gift of, of faith. I'm not talking so much about that right here. I'm just talking about trusting in Jesus, that he's going to work in our lives. And you know, when we get, and, and this is one of the reasons why I'm preaching on spiritual gifts, when we get clarity about what our spiritual gift is, we'll be able to trust God in that. God, this is what I, I know, this is what you've gifted me to do. And if I know if I'm doing this, you're going to bless it. And so there's the prayerful dependence, but there's also faith that, you know what, I can trust, I can trust in you, Jesus. You're going, to, you're going to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that I can ask or imagine as I step out and as I honor you in these ways. So there's faith. We really trust in Jesus and we trust in the work of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. And that doesn't matter what your, what your role is. Everybody has a role of some sort. 
And I know it might be tempting to say, well, you know, I've kind of outlived my prime, and, I, you know, I don't know. I don't have time and energy to do anything that really makes a difference spiritually. Well, I want to I remind you of an example that you know well. You know better than I do. Wilda Motts. First funeral that I did here, and she was 101, I believe. <clears throat> and her grandchildren stood up and testified to the letters that she wrote to them that encouraged them in their faith. You know, we're never too old that God can't use us. And those letters, they came to life in the lives of her children and her grandchildren. And so, no matter who we are, God has something. And it might seem small, but that's where, when the Holy Spirit fills it, the smallest thing can make the biggest difference. That card that just comes at the right time, that only God knows. That prayer. When God moves your heart for somebody else, and they don't even know you're praying for it, and you don't even know what's going on in their life. It doesn't have to be the big upfront performance kind of things. It's small things that God breathes life into. <clears throat> and so we trust that God's going to bless this. God's going to do something through this. And then number three, Jesus is honored. Jesus is honored. It's not the person that gets the honor. You know, we might get, <clears throat> you know, we might get enough encouragement. Somebody once said that, you know, if you're serving Jesus, he'll let you see enough of your fruit to help you keep going, but not so much that it'll make you proud. <laughs> and I, I think that's the way it is, isn't it? He gives us enough, lets us see enough of the changed lives and the fruit of our work to keep us going but not so much that we begin to look at ourselves and, and get proud. Jesus is honored. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, when he comes, he's going to testify of me. And so that's another good way to say, if it's, if it's something that the Holy Spirit's doing, Jesus is going to look big. Jesus is going to be honored. Jesus is going to be magnified. Jesus is going to be the center focus of all of it. Because he's the one who died for our sins and gave us new life. And eternal life starts at that moment when we accept him and we start a new life of him living within us. Second Corinthians 5, 17 said, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things, those would be the human strengths, activities have passed away. The new things have come, which is the life in the Holy Spirit. So are spiritual gifts necessary? I think absolutely. There's really not any other way that we can do it. And as we grow in those, I believe that our effectiveness as a church will grow. People will see those. People will be touched through each of our lives. Let's pray together. Jesus, we come and we, th we thank you. <clears throat> we thank you for taking our lives and taking a natural person, maybe with a lot of talents or maybe with not so many, and filling us with your Holy Spirit, the power of Jesus himself to live in us and through us. Lord, that's still an amazing thing to us. Lord, I ask that you would guide us in our gifts. Help us to know what those are and help us to put our energy there and to surrender to you. God, use us. Lord, we want to be a part of what you're doing in, in our world. So, Father, develop those gifts and strengthen us. And let us truly be the hands and feet of Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen.